great pleasure for me to have been asked to give this introduction and background to the work of the laureates. And I mean it. It is a pleasure. They are friends of mine. They are very good scientific colleagues. And I would call them Dick, and I would call them Tomoko. But I will not do that. I will call them Lewontin and Ota, because that's the most convenient way to talk about them today. You will also hear that we've decided that I'll speak more about Lewontin, and that's natural since he's not here. You will also find <coughs> excuse me, that, uh, and now I start to wander around a bit, you will also find that I like this very much. I like it so much. I haven't included any pretty animals or beautiful flowers or anything like that. It's straightforward population genetics from beginning to end. And I think that is the greatest honor I can give to the laureates themselves to show how interesting what they have done is still perceived to be. We start here. Two papers in 1966. Harry Harris had been at a conference at the Royal Society in London. He was on his way to move to the Galton Institute and there he spoke about enzyme polymorphism in man. L Later, but not much, the same year, very similar results were produced by Lewontin and Hubby. It's a part of a two-paper series. First one was Hubby and Lewontin. That was about the methodology. Here were about the results. A molecular approach to the study of genetic heterozygosity in natural populations, paper two. Amount of variation and degree of heterozygosity in natural populations of Drosophila pseudobscura. Why pseudobscura? Well, Lewontin was a student of the famous evolutionary biologist Dobzhansky, who studied this very species in the wild in the Americas <coughs> for quite some time. So it was natural that he chose that as his organism. Harris was a doctor, so he used man, mankind, to make his studies. What was all this about? Well, it was a major scientific revolution. It's not a word or a concept that I would use easily, but I think it is absolutely correct to use it here. A revolution like that is characterized by you have a world first, before, then you have some kind of event, more or less limited in time, and then you have an after. And when you live in the after, it's almost impossible to reimagine how it was to live in the before. That's why it is a revolution. The world is different. So talking about this, let us see how the world was before these two papers. Before 1966, genetics was well understood. Genes, chromosomes, DNA, genetic code, most of those things were well known were known from various organisms, various study systems, but in general, you couldn't do genetics. If you were interested in a species or something, you couldn't do anything genetically about it because you had nothing to do genetics with. There were some special cases. You have morphological markers, meaning things like eye color in humans, or you had blood groups, or you have human diseases, you have chromosomal mutations in humans, but also in Drosophila and in other places. 
Uh, and then you had that thing called quantitative genetics, when you didn't have any genes at all, but you presumed that they existed, and you could do some statistics around inheritance patterns and so on. That is what you could do. And of course, people were working very hard trying to uh, come down into the world of genetics, doing genetics in more and more places. It's perhaps worth mentioning that Lund was very strong in attempting one promising method, which was paper, paper chromatography, which was run particularly in genetics and the botany departments here. One would try and could get spots showing molecular differences between different strains and genotypes and so on. But it wasn't good enough. The good enough was enzyme electrophoresis. When that came, and that was the method used by both Harris and Hubby and Lewinton. For those of you who are young enough not to know how it all looks like, it looks like this. And some of us have spent a lot of time looking at gels of this kind. What you have here is a gel. This comes from the original paper by Hubby and Lewinton, so it is a polyacrylamide gel. Many of us ran starch gels instead. We took like a fly and we crushed it and we got soaked up the liquid and then we put it into the gel and we applied a current and then everything in there moved, depending on if the molecules were positive or negative and so on, and it moved like that. And then you could stain for certain presence of certain proteins where they had gone. And that was particularly the enzymes, because enzymes, they do things. And when they do things, you could get color to come out. So this is, if you had to be treated it rightly, you had the red, right buffers and not too much electricity and so on, you still had enzyme activity. And that's what you have there. And you see that one and the same larvae, in principle, could give rise to many bands. In this case, meaning there's the protein, the enzyme is made up of two units, and they are different. There is genetic variability. That is what it is. And since enzymes are proteins, proteins are polypeptides, polypeptides are made by genes, when you see differences there, you are down to seeing differences at the genes. That's the fantastic thing. With this method, you got straight from what you could see on those gels into the genes themselves. So, when they showed that you had that kind of variation in humans and in Drosophila, it meant you have it everywhere. And that was the case. That kind of variation, you could go into and you would find in the common shrew or in the sheep's fescue, to choose two species that I've been involved with students and friends to study, genetics could be done in all species and it opens up all kinds of possibilities. You could do subpopulation differentiation, races, speciation, how big are the differences between them. You could do breeding systems, how many birds, how many males did this female bird mate with when she produced her clutch, with there more than one. You could use them for markers for disease or commercial traits in plant breeding or anything like that. Almost everything in biology could now be approached in some way with this kind of genetic tool. And of course you could study the variation at in itself, why is there variation? Is there enough variation for what you want? Or is there almost no variation? But we'll talk more about that later. You find the square brackets are sort of my little comments to this. Uh, but in particular, of course, finding this, everybody says, can't we do it better than that? So one tried better other methods. The obvious would have been to sequence the proteins. And one did sequence proteins, Pauling, Zucker, Candle, and others, and did fantastic things with that, but that was, and still is, very difficult. 
instead restriction enzymes came along and you could cut DNA at well-defined places. And suddenly, it turned out, no, all of this can be done at the DNA level instead. And there was a lot of methods. Some of you will remember RFLP and RAPIDS and AFLP and microsatellites. But look, they are days gone by. We are now in the days of DNA sequencing. The classic paper in DNA sequencing for our purposes. And our purposes are a bit strange. It's not knowing how a gene looks like, but is to know how your and your and your and your and your gene looks like. So we can see what variation there is and why there is differences and so on. So getting more than one gene copy sequence. The classic paper is a paper in Nature by Martin Kreitman, nucleotide polymorphism as alcohol the hydrogenase locus for Drosophila melanogaster. So there's a melanogaster. Eleven sequences of this enzyme was produced and published, and it was a wonderful paper that many of us read over and over and over again for what it contained, and it looked like this. This is the DNA sequence, and you see occasional, this. yeah, that G is there instead of a T. In some of the strains, there's a G that's there instead of an A, and this is how it looks like, and this is the part of the gene that's actually used, so it's translated into amino acids. So, and you see there's no changes except there, the way it's on. Okay, that's how it looked like. And I just wanted to show you that this classical paper, and what do we find at the end? Well, he thanked Walter Gilbert and a number of others. Not bad to get help by Gilbert if you do sequencing. But you see this work was supported by a grant awarded to uh, R.C. Lewontin. So this work was done in Lewontin's lab. So he didn't take part of it in himself, but he continued to take this interest. And we can go there. Who lurks in the background? The answer is Lewent in there. More relevant in general is this, that we now move from an interest in specific genes. It was very much the original, this gene here or that gene here, to long DNA sequences. And that takes us into the first, where we have Orta coming in. Orta wrote very early interesting papers on what happens to gene families. And, you know, when you have genes repeated the same gene over, over, and over, and over again, how many copies do you have? Do they change with time? Do they change the contents with time? What kind of evolutionary process happens along actual chromosomes? Turns out you can ask some questions generally, but you almost need to go specifically into the specific cases. In this case, it was immunoglobulin that, that, that uh, she worked on and thought about two papers in Nature in 77, 78, and then quite a lot. And last time uh, Otta was here in Lund, she was uh, visiting the Mendelian Society and spoke about the evolution of gene families. But let us go back, saying that there were questions about genetic variation that was raised by these original papers. What were those questions? What was the discussion that happened? So we now go into the world of thinking. First of all, it's worth saying that Lewontin's and Harry's results and conclusions, they were never questioned. Nobody said it's wrong, because it wasn't. It was quite obviously, and very soon, everybody else produced very similar results. Enzyme electrophoresis works. You have a lot of variation in almost every species you look like. The cheese doesn't have very much and there may be an elephant seal because they're very inbred, but otherwise you find it almost everywhere. The results raised a most fundamental problem. Already in the discussion of the Lewontin and Harvey paper, the question is, if there is this variation, 
Why is the variation there? A natural, good Darwinian evolution, you say, well, because of selection. Maybe, probably it's bad to have only one type as the gene, and it's bad to have only the other type as the gene, so it's best to have sort of both of them there. But to get that result, you need to select. Not so many of those, not so many of those. That's why you have the balance in between them. Select means to kill or underreproduce. And every plant breeder knows, yes, you can select, you can get results, but you can't select for everything very strongly all the time, because then you'd have nothing left. And they made some calculations almost jokingly, showing that sort of 10 to the minus 39 or something like that of the population would survive if one assumed certain assumptions about selection of these lockers. And look, there's a lot of death out there, but there's not that many selective deaths out there. It's impossible that only a fraction, zero and 39 zeros after that, percent or something like that, would survive. So there was something definitely wrong about our understanding about variation that happened. This led to what I call a very productive crisis. Everybody discussed, fought, were at each other's throat, became enemies, uh, wrote, uh, for almost 10 or 15 years, almost everybody joined in some sense this debate. And it was completely dominated by an answer that was given by Moto Kimura in Japan, also by others, but he was the one that really presented it very well and wrote about it strongly, saying that this is only possible if most of the variation we see is selectively neutral, meaning no, it's there because new mutations have occurred, but it's not there because it's selectively maintained, it just happens. Most of the genetic variation that is observable at the molecular level is not under selection, it's neutral. Well, there is about a fraction not, well, I thought it would actually be, but quite a number of you have taught this formula. H equals 4 n mu divided by 1 plus 4 n mu. I will not prove it now. I could do it. It would be a pleasure, but, but I'm not sure that all of you would, would, would enjoy it. Uh, it is the level of variation that you would expect if there is no selection. It's just new mutations mu mutations, new mutations, and a population size, n individuals in every generation. Well, new mutations come in, but on the other hand, old mutations disappear out by what we call genetic drift. There will be a balance. If the population is very small, there will not be much variation. If the population is very large and the mutation rate is high, there will be a lot. So you see, it will depend on the product of n and mu. And if n mu is very big, you can almost forget that one, and this variation measure is one. And if n mu is very small, you can forget that thing, and you only have this very small thing. So h will go from small to very large, to, to, to one, depending on mutation rate and the um, population size. So that was sort of the basis. We knew that if there's no selection, it should look like this. That was one of the things that went into the discussions. The violent conflicts over neutrality and selection. There was a time when these ideas were thought of as non-Darwinian. And you can expect it how every able-bodied Englishman would react to a statement like that, that you would have evolution that was non-Darwinian. So there was a lot of fights. But then pretty soon came reflections. And now we'll talk a little bit more about Lewontin. And I've chosen the year 1974, when he made two 
what I regard as very important contributions. There's a paper in American Journal of Human Genetics called The Analysis of Variance and Analysis of Causes. And there is a book, The Genetic Basis of Evolutionary Change. Let's start by the paper. I've headed it, understanding is very hard to win. And I rephrase, Lundin says something like, new data are wonderful and rich theories exciting, but when do they lead to any genuine knowledge? Look, he has high demands on us. It's not sufficient to work or produce results. He demands, when do we actually produce interesting, valuable, useful knowledge? And I wanted to put it in because we should know that Lewontin is an important critic of our time. Looking up, see how many articles, how many fascinating things is written in the New York Review of Books for a very long time. You see what a critic, what a stern demander of integrity in arguments that he's been. And in this case, what he discusses is the notion of heritability, where he comes to the conclusion that heritability is a potentially misleading concept that easily produces a feeling that something is understood, in this case that we really understood causes of something, when we just discussed an analysis of variance. And it's timely to talk about this because it's certainly more true now than it ever been. It's a perfect paper. I strongly recommend it to you if you work in this kind of field. Uh, with the so-called missing heritability debate, many people with diseases, they are similar to each other if they're related, but at the same time we can't find any genes particularly involved. Is this a crisis or not? We'll partly come to it later. But that's the question today of missing heritability. Then it's worthwhile reading this paper. But of course, the major contribution that he was this book. This is my copy that I bought immediately and then I read. I claim it's a scientific classic. Yes, I think it will turn out to be. It gives a magisterial overview of the field. Already, you see, there's not many years since he got his first results. He still is able to give an overview over both theory and data and everything. Remarkably good. I've taken out three things. He stresses how difficult it is to measure key parameters in evolutionary biology. In many ways, it is a very pessimistic book. It says, gee, folks, don't be fooled. This is difficult. You can produce data in this species or that species. You can do a lot of things. But if you want to understand evolution and its relationship with genetic variation, no, this is difficult. Selection and things like that is not easy to measure. He stresses one particularly important result. He says that, but look, one of the strange things is that we now look at all these different animals living in different ways. There, this value age, as we talk about the measure of genetic variation, is surprisingly similar all over. Why is that so? You would expect it to be close to one in those where you have big population and very small in ordinary smaller populations, and it seems to stabilize at, at rather similar values. Why is that? And then he tries to put the stage for further work. And one could say that's almost a bit too early. It's still a lot of relevant things that he discusses at the end uh, in his last chapter, but there were so many things he didn't know yet at that time. I think one can say that still he gets to some kind of preliminary closure of the feeling, what, we, what we're dealing with. 
And I've summarized it like this. The idea that evolution follows from selection of single genetic variants is a powerful and satisfying first approximation theory. Which means, yes, we continue to teach evolution the way we normally do to our students. A new good gene, it will spread in the population. That's a unit step in evolution. That works fine. Mendelism and Darwinism together, good. But if we want a more fine-scale understanding of variation, selection and evolution, one must take into account that all genetic variation is context-dependent. Fitness is rarely fixed. Well, if you have a lethal homozygous, meaning that if you have two of those gene copies and you're dead, well, that is pretty fixed. But otherwise, whether a genetic variant is neutral or a little bit good or a little bit bad, or sometimes good, sometimes bad, depending on who else it is together with or when it happens or along the chromosome where it is, then you couldn't say that it, the fitness is very fixed for that variant. If you suddenly notice, no, we can't talk about an ally with fitness 1, another ally with fitness 1 minus HS, and a third one with 1 minus HZ, for example. When you can't do that anymore, assume those fixed numbers, then things become very difficult. But it's not just difficult because you make things complicated, it's difficult because it's necessary difficulty, because there may be things like recombination and sex. We can't understand otherwise. To approach the situation, we have two ways, very early, of how to think about it and deal with it. I've taken two quotes from 73 and 74. Uh, from Lewontin, it's the title of the last chapter of his book. The genome as unit of selection. You must all the time think about the whole context if you want to do selection and think about selection and variation. From Ota, I've taken the small bit of snippet out of a title in a nature paper, slightly deleterious mutant substitutions. So instead of talking about neutral mutations, there's the idea that some mutants are slightly deleterious, so slight that they're almost under the radar of selection, but it's still there, and in a big population it will be noticed, in a small population it will perhaps not be noticed. You could say that the that, that one is a top-down approach. You could say that that is a bottom-up approach. And it would be fair to say that that is still exceedingly difficult. It can only be done with very large computer simulations. While many more people think about these processes in that way, from the point of view of more or less individual sequences or genes and how will they react in the cell. What the agreement is, there is weak and variable direct and indirect selection on perhaps all the millions of base pairs along the chromosomes. So when you have a chromosome almost everywhere, there's some kind of selection influencing one way or the other. And I would say, some of the key problems we discussed today, missing heritability, I've talked about, where all the gene differences that we expect to be there to make relatives get the same diseases, we don't find them. The advantage of sexual recombination, which probably comes from recombination, breaking down associations between different places along the chromosomes, only proven by computer simulations. And Lundin's question, why is the variations in populations about of a similar size? Presumably be because what is a neutral mutation in a small population becomes 
disadvantageous in a large population. So there's sort of a balance so that the mutation rate for neutral mutations goes down when the population size goes up. All of this has to do with this view of a rich chromosome. And I've reached, nope, that one was the one I should push, and that one. And I've reached the end. A scientific revolution that we have talked about doesn't resolve any questions, but it leads to new and better problems. And I would say this is exactly what we celebrate today. Having lived through the whole era, I would say, yes, we have much better more difficult and more messier, perhaps, but we have much better problems today than we had at that time. And I say thank you for your contributions to Lewontin and Ota, or should I say Dick and Tomoko. Thank you very much.